Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. The New Hampshire State Senate could decide the balance of power at the State House next year. No matter how that partisan pendulum swings, as we've seen in recent years in the Granite State, things are likely to be close. Here to discuss their race this morning are the candidates from Senate District 7, the incumbent Senator Dan Innes, a Republican, and the Democratic nominee Stu Green. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Good thanks morning. for having us. So let's start with a very simple and basic question. What are the top priorities for your party if you win the majority in November? We'll start with the challenger, Mr. Green. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invite and thanks for agreeing, Dan. I appreciate it. It's yeah. good to meet you. You as well. Yeah, I'd say the first priority is uh, restoring reproductive rights for women. I find it unconscionable that my daughter has fewer rights than my wife had when she was growing up. And that's something that I think we can push back on. The second priority is ensuring that we have a struggling uh, logging industry in Senate District 7. I would like to do a little work to revitalize that. I see it as an important part of balancing our ecosystem. Uh, I want to keep our wildlife thriving, our forests uh, robust, our air pure, and our lakes clean. But last and most importantly, we have so many families in this district who are on the brink and are crushed by an oppressive property tax regime. I think we can do a lot of work to assist them with that. Senator Innes, what about the priorities for the Republicans if they hold the majority? You know, it's pretty simple for us. Um, we are the freest state in the nation. We have a terrific business climate. We're a welcoming state, and we have a beautiful environment. So I think a lot of the things that Stu mentioned there are on point. But you know, our job is to make sure that we maintain the great conditions that we have, particularly economically. I'll always oppose an income tax and a sales tax. We're working to reduce the business profits tax, the business enterprise tax. That's important to help our small businesses to grow. And we want to get out there and do that. And I think we'll continue to work with our constituencies on important issues like housing. Um, I put in a housing bill last session that got us $50 million for affordable housing. And that's something we really need to pay attention to. Specific to the district, it's a district of hardworking people, farmers, folks who are trying to get by. They work in factories perhaps and they're just trying to find the best environment for their kids and we need we need to provide that I appreciate the property tax issue I think that's a legitimate concern but at the same time I would point out New Hampshire has one of the lowest per capita tax rates in the nation and the Republican Party and this senator are committed to making sure that that remains the case All right, both of you have touched on some issues we want to get to later but let's uh, move now to the state budget that's going to be the big assignment to craft in the coming year you know as you're building that uh, budget Senator Ennis if you're in the majority mm -hmm. what are you going to do with all of the federal dollars probably disappearing where can you cut and what do you have to say you know I hope Adam that we don't have to cut and we can avoid cuts if we continue to keep a robust business economy going continue to support our small businesses and provide a great vacation area for all the folks from Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and elsewhere. Um, that, that rooms and meals tax is a big source of income for us. But you're right, a lot of the federal money, the relief money from COVID and that sort of thing will be gone. But we used a lot of that money to do extra things, not to support the operating budget of the state. So it's my hope that tax revenues will hold up, that we can be thoughtful and frugal, and deliver the services that we need to the people in New Hampshire. I'm confident we can do that. Mr. Green, how about budget priorities for you? Yeah, what I would say, um, going back to the tax issue, is that it's true that in some respect, for some folks, we have a very low tax state. But when I'm knocking on the doors, I'll tell you, nobody in this district feels like they're uh, in a low tax advantage state. Um, we're talking about folks that are on oxygen, COPD, Vietnam vets that are living in trailers that are paying $3,000 a year for property taxes. And some folks that are making 14 bucks an hour that are worried about losing the next paycheck and losing their houses. Those are the things that we need to address because we have so many of those folks in this district. Let's talk about housing now. And to you, Mr. Green, uh, should the state be taking action legislatively to make it easier to develop in the towns that are more resistant to development? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's bipartisan agreement that we have an enormous housing problem. We're 60,000 units short statewide. And there is some low-hanging low fruit that we can grab. You know, and among those are, you know, pushing down sort of more autonomy to the property owners themselves so they can add on those additional dwelling units. Um, that would be an immediate boost to the housing problem. We can reduce the amount of red tape that we've got that's impeding some of this development. Um, and uh, again, you know, when it helps to, when it, when it comes to reducing the cost of housing, which is killing everybody and driving the youth out, the youth that we need, again, we've got to lower those property taxes. How about you, Senator Dennis, and you voted on this. I did. You know, I think, I think it's important when we look at housing to provide opportunities and incentives for developers to get engaged. I don't think government should take the lead. I think we should look for those places where we can bring things forward. We did that with with the $50 million bill a couple of years ago uh, that we got into the budget. 
But I, you know, I like things like historic housing tax credits that enable a developer to maybe see a reduction in property taxes initially to provide that extra incentive to build and to restore parts of our old downtowns where we might have old buildings that could be converted to housing. But one big problem with housing, and you know, the Democratic Party is all in on this sanctuary state, sanctuary city stuff. If we do that, if the Democrats are successful in pushing that forward, we're going to have to house all these people that come here illegally. We're going to have to provide for their schooling. All of this is going to come at New Hampshire taxpayer expense. So we have to look at this in a holistic way and think broadly. You know, housing isn't just one thing. It is a collection of actions that we can take to incent the construction of housing, but also to protect our border and protect our state, keep drugs at a minimum, and try to reduce homelessness by stopping fentanyl at the border. The administration in power hasn't really done that. Uh, Mr. Green, I'll give you a chance to respond on the sanctuary issue there. Yeah, for, I, you know, I think we're actually in agreement on the importance of securing our borders. I spent my whole career in security, so I get it. And that is a dynamic situation that is constantly changing. That is also the responsibility of the federal government. We do have um, some issues with illegal immigration, and it may possibly in the future come to touch New Hampshire. I would say that right now we're bringing it up in, you know, frankly, because it's a little bit of a cynical political ploy. We don't have the same struggles that they have on the border, but I would argue that we have to be very careful about any legislation that we put forward so that we don't reduce the amount of trust between law enforcement agencies and the, and the communities that are residing in our cities and towns. I, I know from personal experience that trust comes very slowly. It is something that easily evaporates. And with some of the legislation this, that has been proposed, um, law enforcement officers themselves have said that this would evaporate or erode their ability to keep us safe. Senator, it's a quick response, then we'll move on to the next one. You know, I think all we have to do is look at Joyce Craig's record in Manchester and how things work there. She was voted out. We have a Republican mayor in place, and that was a rejection of her policies around drugs, around homelessness, around illegal aliens. Let's move on to an issue that is not necessarily a number one for a lot of folks, but it's gotten a lot of attention. There's been a lot of debate at the State House, and we're talking about it right now, and that's uh, transgender athletes and interscholastic mm -hmm. sports. Certainly uh, in Bow recently, the superintendent was just uh, giving no trespass orders to parents who were wearing armbands that were pink with a double X on it. The, allegedly, they were silent, but this was considered a protest and political and perhaps targeting an athlete on the other team. So, Senator Innes, uh, first to the policy. Mm -hmm. You guys passed a bill saying no trans girls in interscholastic sports. Why was that the right thing to do? Yeah, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Look, we put Title IX in place years ago to provide better opportunity for girls and women in sports. Working at UNH as a faculty member, I see that. You know, the opportunities that have been afforded to women. We have an equal number of scholarships for men and women. Title IX was huge in that. And it's being turned on its head when we allow biological males to play sports against girls and women. It's just not an appropriate thing. Boys, even if they're transitioning, are bigger, stronger, faster. And we see that play out in high school sports. And every time a boy finishes in the top, he's taking away the place that a girl or a woman could have had. If a boy finishes first, and we've seen that in, a dis in, in my district, boy finishes first, that girl who would have finished first is now second. This could impact scholarship opportunities for athletes, not to mention create a risk for injury. So I am very much opposed to biological males playing girls sports. Mr. Green, Democrats believe this was the wrong thing to do. What's your position? Yeah, I agree with the Democrat position on this. And I'll say that you don't have to fully believe in the ideology and the movement to understand that folks, whoever they are, however they identify, deserve respect. They deserve to be included. The problem with this is that the law looks pretty simple on the face of it, but there's always a context and there are always unintended consequences. And I think that what Senator Dennis may be de-emphasizing a little too much is that we have effectively put a target on the backs of the kids who are already the most vulnerable. I'm not discounting some of the things that you say, but I think when you look at the, the, the effects of this, you end up with behavior like what we saw in, in Bo, where we had parents, fully grown adults, who were coming to that event, targeting those children, and doing the exact opposite of what these kids are supposed to be learning in terms of d team sports, where you're all pulling in the same direction, you're integrating multiple people with different identities, and you're working for a common purpose. This was terrible sportsmanship, and that's exactly the kind of behavior that legislation like this enables.
Adam, I don't think your question was about sportsmanship and what happened in Bo necessarily, but the bill that we passed. And well, what about Bo? Do you think that was, was that harassment or was I that think free it speech? Might, it might have bordered on that. Yeah, I, th I think people need to be more thoughtful about this. And, you know, remember, I'm a gay man, so I'm, a, I'm fairly close to this issue. And um, I think I have a decent understanding of it. And we always have to be respectful. I mean, people can disagree. We disagree on some issues, but it's respectful. And that's, that's what everybody should do. And we should never put children in the middle. And I'm afraid that's what happened in Bo. Let's get one more issue here in uh, reproductive rights. Uh, Mr. Green, why does the current state law need to be repealed? Well, like I said earlier, my daughter now has fewer rights than, than my wife did when she was growing up. Um, I firmly believe, as a majority of New Hampshire uh, residents believe, and frankly, most New Englanders believe, that that is a decision that is private and between the, the woman her, it be, it's her body, her domain, and the doctors. It's a very difficult decision. Nobody wants to have abortions, um, and yet we have these laws that are categorical and unforgiving and unable to account for the very difficult decisions when those times come up. Senator Ennis? I think we have a pretty good law, and you know, up to six months, uh, abortion is easily accessible. Um, after that, we have exclusions for health issues. So. Women in New Hampshire can get an abortion all the way through. Um, I do think it should be a choice between a woman and her doctor. It's really about women's rights and letting them be heard. And, you know, the my body, my choice comment that's made, I understand that. When we look at COVID, um, UNH and, and NASA tried to force me to get a, ca a, a vaccine. I said, my body, my choice. So I understand where they're coming from. I'm sensitive to it. Our law is about the same as 40 other states, including Massachusetts. It's a good law. It works. All right, Senator Ennis, Mr. Green, uh, thanks so much for your time today. We got to enough issues, I think, but we wish we could do more, but <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. All right, and we'll be right back to take this general election discussion to the race for executive council in the 4th District. Stay with us.